Well, good morning. My name is Sylvie Barbier, and today I will be hosting Jamie Bristow uh, on our series called Once Upon a Time. And so, Jamie, I'm really happy to have you today. And I'd love to first ask you a kind of uh, very complex question and feel free to take it wherever you want, which is, who are you? <laughs> wow. Well, it's lovely to be here, Sylvie. And yeah, what a, what a pleasure to perhaps come at that question in a fresh way. I'll try and avoid, you know, the practiced lines and um, yeah, start anew. Who am I? Um, I am a mystic, a seeker, uh, a change agent, and those things are all interlinked for me. I am a husband, uh, an increasingly active member of my local community, trying to yeah, trying to build roots and relationships on my street and in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, brother or son, I'm a writer. And that's been interesting recently deciding that I'm, that I maybe primarily am a writer rather than how I've spent most of my career, spent most of my career doing. Um, and I'm a rock climber, a runner, a yogi, a meditation teacher. There you go. There's a okay. scattergun. Yes. Scattergun the bunch of, of, of a human being, as human beings have multitudes of facets and dimension to become whole. And I love to understand a little bit like some people don't know who you are or what you're up to. And I love to kind of let them understand a little bit. What are you up to in your life? What are what is really your calling that you get to fulfill on with your action currently? That might be in your career, but also related to your spirituality. Yeah, thank you. Well, the professional story that I am a bit more used to to reeling off um, starts in my early career in advertising, starting to, I, 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 I meditated, I started picking up the practice of meditation and mindfulness in order to be better at that job, in order to be, to work longer hours, to make better commercials for SUVs and the various other brands that I was working on. And then you know, I got that benefit. Do you know what I mean? I could, I had better concentration powers, and I could work longer. But then I also got more than I bargained for, and I discovered more things about myself. You know, I explored um, my heart and mind, and discovered that what I found showed me that the life I was leading wasn't right for me or for the world. And I ended up in a climate change campaign. Um, quitting, you know, quitting my job and initially working for free. And it was in, it was in that period that I, um, well, first of all, got a bit disillusioned with climate change campaign communications and the effect that they were having, uh, because still now actually very little has changed. Um, and I looked at myself and I thought, um, why did I suddenly going from, go from working, you know, making commercials for for Nissan and you know um thinking that was that was just totally fine um good use of my time to to caring about well convincing people to to buy fewer SUVs because of the state of things and it was the same information landing differently because my heart and mind had transformed had changed and that core insight that there was an inner dimension to sustainability issues and mm. and climate action um that's been my sort of guiding insight guiding principle for the last 12 years or so i initially mm. thought well everyone just has to meditate more and so i i, I worked for headspace for a bit because i thought that that was like rebranding meditation 
and helping you know get it to places where it hadn't been considered um and then through that got involved in politics sorry the application of mindfulness training in politics and public policy so i was invited to support some politicians to um look at how mindfulness could be better applied in schools hospitals prisons police forces you know that, that kind of thing because many of them had actually been practicing mindfulness by that point for for a year or so and became interested in, in how they could share it in the same way that i went to headspace to try and share it they were interested in public policy and I'm basically i've been doing that for the last 10 years mm. so um you know both in the, in the British Parliament, where there's been an all party parliamentary group on mindfulness since 2014. Um, and then around the world, because many, because um, politicians and policymakers from all kinds of countries saw what we're doing in the UK and they said, like, can you come and talk to us about how we might do something similar here? And so it's been a great pleasure to, yeah, we've helped to establish mindfulness training in the French Parliament and Dutch Parliament and Canadian, Sri Lankan. Uh, very nice. What have been your finding currently in this what journey? Finding? Well, we're actually just about to come up to well, we just passed ten years of mindfulness in the British Parliament, and we've done we worked with some academics to do some semi-structured interviews, um, like you know, like rigorous uh, interviews, and then publishing the results in uh, academic papers. Uh, and, and also creating a policy report, which will be out in September this year. And, and uh, what we what we found in politicians own words is that they uh, have found personal performance benefit. Um, uh, they found benefit to their sort of ability to do public speaking um, and and uh, their own sort of individual resilience has been improved. So that's the, all the category of kind of individual benefit. But then they also report interpersonal benefits so that their relationships both with their family mm. and friends but particularly colleagues and adversaries even you know in in in, in parliament are, are different so they have different sorts of relationships can bring more of themselves into the political space because wow. of the training they re they've received and because of the kind of the culture of these sort of like meditation groups essentially that have been running and, and then finally, there's a, you know, some of them talk about the potential and the kind of green shoots um, of culture shift mm -hmm. of, of not just individual interpersonal relationships changing, but in some way, the kind of culture within within Parliament, um, mm -hmm. at least amongst those who have been on a mindfulness course. And, and now um, 300 MPs and members of the House of Lords have had some mindfulness training. So that, that that's still a minority but it's you know it's shifting so th that's been really interesting and and what i'm most known for i guess more recently is going beyond the kind of applications of mindfulness in schools and hospitals etc where the evidence is strongest but but writing on the subject of how mindfulness and compassion as you know natural human capacities could be foundational mm -hmm. to a more flourishing society and more skillful responses to our sustainability crises. So I recently published a report with a sustainability sciences professor, Christian Vamslow, called Reconnection, Meeting the Climate Crisis Inside Out. So um, that one sort of threading together the evidence base for bigger than, for the application of contemplative practices to bigger than self concerns um, through into a, into a narrative that makes sense of many people's intuition that somehow actually we need to develop ourselves to be more equal to the challenges of the times we now yeah. face. What I love about your story is that um, you first use meditation as a tool to perform better, uh, to outcompete maybe or perform better in the current system, mm. uh, but in, then in a way might have hijacked you <laughs> yeah. and take you into a whole different path but inside that I also hear that in a way you have to also meet people where they are at rather than you know where we'd like them to be mm. because who knows maybe if you were given meditation for a spiritual transformative experience you might have not taken that mm -hmm. it 
but for for where you were at you took you took it and and that's a and it's also life is full of surprise you don't know who's going to switch and why they're going to switch and and in a way i'd love to understand because in a sense i hear that maybe a, a seed was planted at that moment in your life and it bloomed uh, and it awaken you to have a, a, comp- a different understanding of your worldview. And I'd love to also understand maybe a little bit more your, your background, um, both in maybe what had you had be able to, like I understand that uh, being in touch with meditation help you to do that switch. But was there maybe also other things in your, in your childhood, in your path that might have of uh, create a fertile soil for that seed to be able to actually um, grow when it got planted. So yeah, yeah I'd love to, to understand a little bit, like, you know, for example, like what was your family value system? You know, what was your social economical environment in which you grew up? Um, mm. Yeah, that's that's an interesting one. I mean. Uh, we, we, I mean, I grew up in pretty comfortable material circumstances. Um, but a kind of, a kind of spiritual poverty in, 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 in another sense. Um, on the one hand, you know, my, my dad was a kind of amateur armchair philosopher. And so, um, his our, our relationship was really formative for me because he would you know get me into sort of various thought experiments you know like how how do you know that you're not actually just a brain in a jar and that mm-hmm. and that your kind of your vision or your 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 senses are actually just signals fed fed into this brain by some kind of computer like uh, and, and to an 11 11 year old or however however old I would have been at that time you know it kind of like you know bl- blows open what you you know what you think is going going on here as you inquire into that and go like how do I know that that's not the case you know Mm -hmm. and so that was that was really helpful but it was all very much within what I'd say as a kind of uh, scientific materialist Mm -hmm. even somewhat nihilist frame yes um and actually where I've gone to more recently and I think you know I think when you said like who are you I think one I think was it the first word that I said that I'm a mystic you know or actually a post buddhist mystic I sometimes describe myself as like I'm very much dedicated to buddhist practice and continuing that path um but but also um have a kind of perhaps broader ontology cosmology um you know, uh, openness to what it is that's going on here that, that doesn't really fit within a within the Buddhist sort of religious dogma. Um, and so, and so, yeah, I, bo- I both had this kind of inquiring and curious philosophical background, but one that was sort of kind of flat mm-hmm. in a kind of soul spiritual sense. Mm-hmm. It was the flattened world of the scientific materialist. Yeah, so I, I hear that it was flat and there was an essence or so maybe in the scientific materialist worldview that had maybe the, a dimension of being an inquiry about mm-hmm. life yeah. that was maybe one positive element of it that when when that seed came in, allow it to continue in that inquiry that develop into the spiritual realm. Yes, that's that's well said. Yes, exactly, and and in a way, yeah, that 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 inquiry led, led led me to the place which kind of ate its ate the very foundational assumptions of of, of its own worldview. Yeah, um, and you know the so the other the other thing that came to mind was um, was a couple of different things in my sort of adolescence. I, I grew up in California for a few years when I was a kid, sort of eight to 11 ish. Um, and when I was over there, my dad picked up a, a short meditation tape um, called the five minute supercharger. Uh, and 
I th- he brought, brought it back from California and I think he gave it to me when I was sort of 15 or so. And I think I must have played it only a couple of times. So it's not exactly, you know, the root of my meditation practice. Um, but at least it, it made me open to the possibility of closing my eyes, intending to do something and following some guidance and actually my inner landscape being quite significantly shifted in a relatively short space of time. So that by the time I, I um, went to university and there was like a meditation society, um, I joined up in my first year. That was when you know, my path really started. But I was already open to the possibility that this could be helpful because of that like just five minute experience. That's incredible. That's and it was incredible. like, it was so different from the kind of ethos behind mindfulness. It was so new age California in tone. You know, it was like you are sitting next to a stream and it's filling up this lake and this lake is your energies. And and uh, so it was a visualization basically about how, how this water was flowing into your 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 life force or something. Um, so that was groovy and, then. And can I ask you, you say you're uh, your brother, you have siblings mm. and um, what is very interesting in siblings when one has siblings is you grew up in the same family and in the same obvious, often in the same social economical environment, but yet there's sometimes huge variation. And I'd love to understand maybe um, uh, why do you think that you I, first, I don't know if your siblings have taken similar path to you. And if uh, it's not the case, then why do you think you taken this path and maybe not them? Oh, a lovely question. Yeah, huh? I said lovely question. Um, yeah, there, of course, there are similarities and there are differences. And I think this being a seeker, which itself is a bit of a kind of new age California kind of phrase, but but um, but I think it kind of does give a a sense of, a, of an overall orientation or disposition towards finding something beyond what we have here, going deeper, uh, that sense of inquiry into the, the sort of spiritual or ontological realm. And my brother doesn't have that so much. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he has dabbled with things like meditation, um, and one of the reasons is, you know, I, I was quite an unhappy teenager. Like I've, I've had quite a lot to overcome. Um, in the way maybe he has, he has less so. Mm-hmm. And that's one part of it. So I was actually a very happy kid until, until I went to California. Um, and actually I was on track to really, you know, um, recover the kind of dislocation of m- moving to a different culture and a different continent. When we came straight back again, you know, we came back, you know, after a little bit less than three years, I think. And and my re-entry into the into British culture, British school culture, was really tough. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was that kind of dislocation and and the kind of some social trauma as a kind of bumpy landing back in the UK, which then spun off to other forms of difficulty. Um, that made me actually pretty unhappy and depressed. Um, yeah, in my in, in my teenage years. And at one point, I realized actually, people didn't like me very much. Like I was, I had I had friends, I had enough friends to ask, why don't people like me? you know, and good friends enough for them to tell me and trying to help, you know, mm. but, but there was a sudden realization that like, I'm unhappy. I'm not making anybody else happy here either. Like, like, you know, um, I'm, uh, I'm something I'm doing is maladaptive. Um, mm. and that was really the path, the beginning of the path. Now I come to think of it of, um, inner development, even before meditation was the main articulation of that. And actually even before the advertising bit of the story, when I realized I wanted to be a different person. Mm. And initially I wanted to be okay. And I wanted to be liked enough to be, you know, um, I don't know, somewhat somewhat averagely 
or in a normal amount of liked and uh, happy. And I was like, well, I need some wisdom. And, and, and I kind of hoovered up what, what I could find. But again, like, like, a, like I said, a little bit rudderless, didn't have the spiritual leaders or a spiritual tradition. And there's that spiritual poverty I kind of mentioned. And then, and then, and then actually it was, it, it, sorry? Very functional. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I, well, I mean, it was kind of actually in poetry that I, that I could most find little nuggets of wisdom. So I sort of read lots of poetry and particularly that po those po poets that were trying to kind of like pass on some kind of insight or, or, or knowledge about how to how to navigate this, the, you know, this thing called life. And I, and I, I, had to, I think I got, you know, within a few years to a point where I was OK and I was liked and um, in fact, I was sort of pathologically trying trying to be liked for some years, and it wasn't until I was elected president of my students' union at university, and I had like thousands of people voting for me to, you know, that, that I could I, I I kind of like slayed that demon and, and put that to rest. I was like, you know what, I can just I can not try be trying quite so hard now, um, uh, because until that point, yeah, I was probably insufferable, um, and. Uh, anyway, I, I, and I kind of think I just over overshot the mark at that point. You've est I established routines, habits, processes to try and be a better person, to try and be happier, to try and be okay. And I reached that point, perhaps that, you know, most people are um, uh, muddling along, but happy enough. And then and, but I had already established those habits and processes. And so it just sort of kept on going. Um, drawing in more and more um, bit wisdom uh, process you know have like uh, practices uh, and ways of of uh, yeah seeing what, what what real flourishing could be and and the, you know the buddhist path the part the path of contemplative practice and inner development more broadly is so deep like it keeps on going it keeps on going there is no end the levels of freedom wonder um uh you know deep resource skillfulness uh bliss that are, that are possible when you do keep on going are, are quite yeah i mean just not recognized by um by science or or um the vast majority of people um thank you so much for sharing about maybe those difficult moment in your teenage years and childhood because there's a saying of like um no mud, no lotus. Mm. Um, and that sometime when we experience suffering, we don't see, receive them, we perceive them that actually they, these rocks can become diamonds. Um, but it, it, in my understanding, in my perception, often people who have gone through a transformative path and an evolution, there was also a great moment of, of having to encounter great suffering. Um, and what it sounds very interesting is that there was suffering and there was at this teenage period already an, an, a mod like that you could change. Like that's kind of really quite unique because a lot of people don't think that they can change. Mm -hmm. People think like, that's just the way I am, you know? Oh, if I'm just like a, a person that people don't like, no way I can change. And this mindset of like, you know, I'm going to change myself to, to be likable. Like it, it's, um, it, it, it's quite um, particular. And I think there's maybe something very key to that idea. Uh, because if we believe that we're fixed and we can't change, then, you know, there's no hope, there's no possibility. But if you hold in you the possibility that you can transform mm. or you can change, then that already opens something up. Um, yes. Yeah. And I mean, I also think like, um, was there, you know, that you, was there any moments maybe in your spiritual path when you were already maybe deeper into your spiritual path where you encounter uh, uh like some people name it a dark night of a soul or like some really difficulty or doubt in regards to your spirituality or faith. And mm -hmm. what was maybe your journey uh, through that? Yeah. 
there were, I absolutely had a dark night of the soul um, period. And this was when I had already woken up to some extent. I had no longer, I no longer had the, the vision of being a advertising agency CEO is my, my main life aspiration, you know, and I, I, I was starting to um, come away from that path and find a new one. Uh, and I still had a lot of the, what we call in Buddhism, like the, the old refuges, refuges of, um, say, numbing through alcohol or, you know, the old, the old ways of, of, of uh, making ourselves feel okay with, with difficulty. Um, and I hadn't yet found my new refuges. You know, the refuge of, of awareness, of turning towards the difficult with a bright mind and an open heart. And part of me still wanted to cleave to the old, the old ways. And that's often one of the elements or um, characteristics of a, of a dark night, like you know, a little bit like where we are in society and as a whole at the moment, you can always call us in the dark night of the soul socially, where the old ways are no longer serving us, but the, but the new world has not yet been born with new, you know, new, new refuges. Um, and also, you know, the, there is actually a more technical dark night of the soul when it comes in to, to, to meditation. Um, like there are ways in which your mind can change and you can see yourself as less solid and fixed and separate. Um, and the initial reaction to that can be actually kind of sense of disgust or disease or feeling, feeling lost. It's like, wow, I'm not what I thought I was. Um, I, I, it's a much, it's a much looser and more like an eddy in a stream, you know, a much looser kind of like, um, phenomena than, than the kind of, uh, yeah, like I said, the fixed and separateness that we, that we're sort of born in, into, um, seeing. Um, and that is often in the Buddha, in the kind of meditative traditions talk, talked about a dark night of the soul. And I had that really, really big time as well. And there was a period where I was a bit lost. Um, and eventually I realized the, the only way out of it was hitting the accelerator in my practice. There was no way back to see mm -hmm. myself the way I used to. I had, I'd seen too much, you know, it, it was through insight and through, through meditation practice that I, I seen things that cannot be unseen and things that therefore started to disassemble or, or, um, not fabricate in the same way. Um, and I couldn't go back to, to the, like I say, the, the, the old sources of, of succor or refuge, um, because I saw that they actually created more suffering and, and, and then they didn't give me the satisfaction that I thought that, I, that, that, that we assume that they do, that the, you know, the ignorant mind thinks that they have. So I had to hit the accelerator and find, you know, find new ways of being new ways of seeing myself and, and, and new sources of um yeah contentment ease or, or soccer so um so yeah that one when was that that was like back in 2008 2009 something like that i was in that period for a couple of years and after that it was like practice and the and the path of transformation liberation was became the main sort of you know the main thrust of my life and also then became a kind of spiritual quest of service as well and that's what really ultimately gives you liberation you know i mentioned really trying to be okay really trying to be happy from the time when i was an unhappy teenager and that you know that orientation combined with wisdom and practices can make you can make you happy to an extent but what's what i found this, you know while you're still focused on me and my happiness and what i can do to make me feel better you're still stuck within a certain paradigm 
which will limit your actual happiness. Mm. And it is living for service, living for the benefit of others and letting go of that sense of like, what do I need to be okay or, or, or happy or safe? And think more about what other people need to be okay, happy and safe. Suddenly, actually, that gets to a whole new level of well-being that isn't possible before. And, and that, yeah, that dark night, I guess, was the thing that um, brought me from one phase to the next. Um, like a lot of the things you say, um, you know, we understand them maybe intellectually and it's a whole other thing to discover them for oneself. You know, the distinction of like, oh, a greater level of actually even joy is in service. Most spiritual tradition talk about service. Um, and was there in, in this in this kind of transition and path of transitioning, um, and I guess you're still on your path, you know, because we're, <laughs> we're alive. Um, was there also more, one way I found very fascinating is that there was like a first version of that journey as a teenager of like, I'm unhappy, I'm going to change myself. And a second version, upgraded version of like, oh, I'm unhappy, I also need to change myself, let's push the accelerator to like, go there and why can maybe why I'm asking you this question is like maybe sometime in my path I uh I sense that I'm in this in between I still have lots of things from the old world and my old habits I'm also going through uh something new and exciting and there's mo very many moments where the old one is still clinging you know it does not want to let go and it's trying to find that that um and i know that sometimes if i repress that part too much don't listen to it it almost backlash you know, almost like uh st stunt the progress because it didn't feel safe enough to be able to let go and i'd love to hear a little bit like maybe that that's a, a bit more of a granular view into your transformational journey um yes if you had encountered these moments and what uh, what practices what what did you find helpful in in being able to con continue further down the path when there was maybe moments of doubts? Mm. So, if I understand the question correctly, it's when there are moments when you're feeling like some kind of phase shift is necessary or if there's a kind of block or feeling stuck and we really need to sort of like you know break on through to a new a new phase or is that yeah what, what do we do and what and, and is that is that yes it's a little bit what you say is like we're actually also experiencing that collectively the old world is dying the new world is not born yet mm. and there's a like a, there's moments of tension of like uh between these two worlds mm. and and how and i guess you know like when you hit the accelerator there there, there must be a, a faith you know to hit the accelerator you must have a form mm. of that it will lead you to something better than the old world mm. and yeah i just love to kind of maybe understand more your relationship to to this to your faith in a way yeah faith faith's a great word and, and you know as i mentioned earlier faith isn't a word that i was comfortable with growing up you know it's not it's certainly not a word that we had in our family and it's taken me i've been on a real journey with words like that you know faith sacredness even divinity mm. um faith for me means many different things and, and and one is the faith in the path the faith that yeah investment in this kind of work mm. um will be rewarded that it's worth the effort mm. and faith grows over time and it's both faith in the practices and kind of faith in a foundational goodness of the human spirit that actually clearing away the obstacles to that basic goodness mm. um 
and moving towards sort of freedom and allowing that basic goodness to to be a kind of creative force in your life will um, be beneficial to you and and, and others. Um, mm. And then there are other sorts of faith that, that, that are more, you know, to do with sort of, yeah, ideas about what's going on here in this in this sort of crazy existence. Yeah, but, I think you put it so brilliantly because uh, I I also strongly sense that to to for this new world to be born, it requires an act of faith mm. to have faith in humanity ultimately. Mm. Yeah, and it's something that we we need to nourish and so uh yeah and, and, I, and i and i offer this as kind of travel notes from from the end from the edge of edge of the known psychic universe <laughs> or like as a psychonaut you know that i've done a lot of practice in a lot of different approaches and I have strong reason to believe in this in this sort of principle of basic goodness, which is part of some Buddhist traditions. Yes. That this is one of their main principles. And but and rather than just holding that as a nice idea or as a principle of faith, I have strong evidence now to to believe it strongly. Mm. Um and I say that just as a ray of hope, really, that that um, well, the Buddhist path is both deeply cynical and also optimistic in that way. You know, it also teaches us that we have fundamental ignorances, like I said before, that we're kind of born with, we're born into like seeing things in the wrong way, perhaps because it helped us to propagate our genes, so we've kind of evolved into these these. Um, ways of seeing but but that we can unpick the, that ignorance mm -hmm. and unfortunately that ignorance drives our greed and our hatred and our anger etc and, and all the things that make our life so our world so volatile and unjust and unsustainable um so that's the, the cynical bit I, I, I guess mm -hmm. um that we are all of us uh implicated in the problems of the world because we're all carrying this legacy and tendency towards what we call greed and aversion or the, you know, the desire to grab what you want and push away what you don't want and down the rest um and um yeah i've, I've gone off track a little bit here but like coming back to the the, the um the original why I'm, the original reason I, I sort of mentioned faith as a really good word is that Faith is important to make a practice deeper and more committed. Mm. And you can't expect yourself to do an hour's meditation a day if you don't really feel in the bones that that is worth your time. And mm. that's why starting out small and not stressing yourself out, doing five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and getting up to the point where, you know, if I, I find for me an hour and 15 minutes is in the morning is 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 absolutely worth it and about about at that point, you know, I feel like it's time to get up. Mm. Um, and that I've got so much I want to do with my day I've got so many conflicting priorities and work projects I desperately want to do, but still it's worth doing that hour and a quarter. Even though I could be using that that time for some other thing. And it's not so much about me feeling well and happy because it does have that, but I'm so much more productive. I'm less likely to make mistakes. You know, it saves time in the long run. I'm more skillful in relationship. I listen better. You know, I respond in a more sort of aligned and creative way, et cetera, et cetera. But the faith that I need in order to be able to, 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 to do that has been, has been one of the things that's been developed over 22 years of practice, you know, mm. um, and we kind of just need to develop that faith along with all the other dimensions of development that come with such a path. Mm. And so, and so, yeah, what happens when our faith is tested and we're, and we're not sure, you know, how do we break through to that next, that next jump, you know? Well, I think the funny thing is in a way I've 
think that hearing you, I got the answers when I, since like when one have doubt, you need, you need a sangha. Mm. When you have doubt in your faith, you need a sangha to remind you to have faith. Yeah. Yeah. So sangha, you know, the, uh, I guess you could call it sort of uh, the word for spiritual community in, in ancient Indian languages, um, like Pali and Sanskrit, at least, uh, is being adopted in you know Western society because we don't really have a word that quite fits that. I mean, I guess spiritual community is close, um, and the the kind of definition of it, or one poetic way of describing it that I that I really love, is those who sing your song back to you when you have forgotten it. Mm. And the ways in which you get lost, or one gets lost on the path, become subtler over time. You know, mm. early on, and like I would, I would binge on Buddhism as I would describe it. So I'd like do Buddhism for a bit, you know, and like get into the philosophy and do some practice or whatever, and then I completely go off the rails and completely forget about it and do you know, like I say, going back to those old refuges, you know, um, the partying or the whatever. Um, not that partying's bad, of course, now and again. Um, <laughs> but like the ways in which I got lost were quite dramatic and obvious. The ways I get lost now are much subtler. You wouldn't necessarily see them from the outside, but they still get lost. Mm. Um, and, he, and, and you know, the, the, the spiritual world is littered with scandals where teachers, usually because they're isolated by being put on a pedestal, well above the rest of the spiritual community, then commit some kind of act or, or, or a scandal ensues. Um, they get lost too. And I think actually it's the separation from the Sangha because of their kind of removal and, and, and sort of like raising up above and away from that spiritual community. They haven't got, uh, and people don't feel they can sing the song back to them mm. or they don't ask for it or have ways of doing that. That's where problems come in. So, mm. so like, actually, they're not subtle ways. Often they're quite dramatic ways. People get, you know, get, get lost and cause problems. But for me anyway, um, yeah, I still, I still need to hear that song sometimes. Well, thank you so much for such beautiful sharing um, and so authentic. I, I hope uh, the audience will get as much as I, I did. And um yeah any maybe last question is like any book that has maybe changed your life that you recommend or open you know blown your mind in some ways that you recommend for our audience to to read yeah i mean it's it's a it's a real classic often recommended and was important to me at a particular time and that that's jack cornfield's uh, book a path with heart so for someone kind of orienting towards the, the path I've been sketching a little bit, um, who maybe has done a little bit of meditation um, uh, and, you know, wants to understand what you know, deeper practice might entail and, 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 and um, encouragements in that direction. It's a, it's a lovely book. It's not a meditation manual. It's much more about, you know, the life of a spiritual practitioner, really. Um, and and for me, it helped me through that that dark night period. Mm. Um, and actually, an additional um, mention to um, a, a controversially titled book called um, "Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha" um, by Daniel Ingram, which which also talks about that this dark night thing. So, if anyone has you know that resonates with them, I'd recommend checking out uh, that book, although it's. It uh, has some issues, but um, uh, yeah, I think I think that's I think that's that's uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I feel I could keep going on, and uh, <laughs> we are at time. Um, I, I, and I I just you know plug my own report reconnection meeting the climate crisis inside out again because if you're interested in 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 yeah the the reasons why this these practices are important 
the um, future of our world that I think um, should help. And it's a real privilege to uh, get to know you. And because once you're on the path and you know there's other people also on the path, it makes walking this path uh, much more easier and sweeter. Mm. Well said. Yeah. Well, um, well, thank you everybody for listening and uh, we'll hear from you again. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.